I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Diptula. We're the host of the Strictly Stalking podcast. Strictly Stalking is a true crime podcast that explores stalking stories told by the survivors in their own words. Join us every Tuesday as we interview survivors, advocates, and experts to give you a deep dive into the workings of a stalking case. Would you know where to turn if you or someone you know is being stalked? We'll also give you the resources to fight back, know your rights, and get justice. Find Strictly Stalking wherever you listen to podcasts from Podcast One. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we talk theories. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my Barazina co-host, Alice. Hi, Brett. Hi, Not Alice. a clue what you just said, but it sounded it like ballerina. Carefree. Oh, I don't know how yeah. carefree you can be at the stage of life, but I I strive to be. Oh well, you 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 give off carefree vibes, even if you're not. That's why people love you, Alice. <laughs> You're adorable, as someone said in the chat room. Oh, that's so nice. I cannot read the chat as quickly as you can, Brett. And mm. I, I applaud you for your fast reading capabilities. I'm always on the lookout for compliments. <laughs> for me. <laughs> even, if it's, even if it's a compliment of you, which is fine. Oh, it's fine. Isn't that's that okay. the truth, I'll though? I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll but take you it. know what? That That actually is wonderful because I don't feel carefree at all. But... Doing this entire series, and we're you know closing in on the end with Adnan. It has been such a transporting experience to go back to like senior year of high school, high school, the '90s. For me, more carefree days. But sadly, in this instance, you know these kids truly they were kids on the cusp of some of their most carefree days. This, I mean, this just shook Woodlawn High School, and I know has lasting ramifications beyond just Hay and Adnan and everything we're discussing here. This is a case that, you know, if if it happened around you at that age, I can only imagine how it has stuck with you your entire life, and there's a reason that it has gripped the nation for so long. And as we're closing in on it, I'm I'm a little bit, I feel like we need to let those theories out into the world, even if we're going to get pummeled for them. I agree, Alice. And I got to say, I wasn't really looking forward to doing this case. As I've said, I, this was one that was on the list and I knew we'd do it eventually, but I just wasn't, I wasn't as excited about it as I am about some of the cases we, we've done. But I think I have enjoyed doing this far more than I ever could have imagined. I don't know if it's doing it with the the folks in the chat, our patrons in the chat, or or what, or just I just love spending time with you. But I am actually sad to to see this close down, and I didn't think I would be. You know, we probably got this episode and one more left, and that's going to be it. And then we'll we'll move on to something else, and we'll leave this behind. But as you said, for the people who are involved, they're never going to leave it behind. One thing I do want to say, if you haven't had an opportunity to check it out yet. Alice and I did a couple episodes with Jason Blair of the Silver Linings Handbook podcast. It was a lot of fun. We had a great time. I think it was a good listen. So if you haven't listened to that yet, I hope you will check that out. With that said, Alice, we have talked about all of the evidence in this case. We haven't really talked about all the evidence in this case. We have distilled what we think is important (laughs) down for you over the last dozen or so episodes. We intentionally didn't talk about everything because we weren't going to do this podcast for the rest of our lives. There are things that people think are important we didn't discuss. We've we've hurt you. We're not going to add it in now. (laughs) Sorry. And we've come to a point where I think we have talked about enough stuff that we are ready to go through the theories in this case. 
both the theories that people have and then ending up with our own theory about what happened. And with that, I say, Alice, let's just dive in. Let's just dive in. And, you know, we're going to go through lots of theories and we're going to try to give you the best arguments for them. And look, you don't have to agree with any of these theories. You may have your own theories. You may not agree with us. Go for it. We are always open for discussion. So let's start with the first one. And that is that some random person killed Hay. Whether it's Alonzo Sellers, a serial killer like Ronald Lee Moore, or some other random unknown. Some have speculated that maybe Hay was grabbed and murdered by a random attacker. The problem here is it really doesn't make any sense. And there's certainly no evidence of it. If Hay was killed by a random attacker, then she must have left campus to do something. What? Exactly? We just don't know. If she were grabbed, we also don't know where she was grabbed. Hay would have had to have run some errand that put her in harm's way, and then she was grabbed and murdered. It's possible, I guess, but if it happened, it's a complete mystery. Nobody saw her. No one knew that she had some place to go. She was in some place that was remote enough that a stranger would have approached her and been able to grab her and do harm to her before anyone around her noticed. There isn't even a hint of Hay going somewhere else that day. We know she's at school until the end of the school day. There are no questionable sightings. There's absolutely nothing you can hang on within the evidence of this case that can point to the fact that this was a random attacker. But we start there because random attacks do happen. They do happen. And and as we're going to talk about, they usually have some characteristics to them that we don't see here. There's a lot of when you get into these sort of alternate theories, then the one the state went with. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of creative storytelling. We're going to tell some of those stories as we go through this. And, you know, one place people start, Alice already mentioned it, is Ronald Lee Moore, serial killer. Everybody's favorite alternate theory that is probably the most unlikely of any. Of any particular murder you have, the most unlikely conclusion is that a serial killer did it. Serial killers obviously exist. They murder people, <laughs> and and uh, there is some possibility that anytime someone is killed mysteriously, it is a serial killer, but it's pretty rare. The serial killer that people have picked in this case is Ronald Lee Moore. Serial, if you listen to Serial, kind of just threw his name out at the end, and some people have, have run with that. The problem with Ronald Lee Moore is, once again, there's not really much evidence that he was involved. The only evidence people point to is one of his victims was Annalise Yong Suk Lee, who was from Baltimore, Maryland, and she was murdered by him, and she was strangled by him. The problem is, like most serial killers, Ronald Lee Moore, when he killed her, did not take the time to do something like bury her body somewhere so it would never be found. He killed her in her apartment, and he left her body there. And that's what you see with a lot of these random killings. And the fact that someone took... Hay's body to a park and took the time not that far away from the road to bury her is one of those strong indicators that you'll see people talk about in the behavioral analysis realm that this wasn't just someone random it's not that random killers don't ever bury someone they do on occasion serial killers when they bury somebody it tends to be more of sort of a part of their thing so you know, Gacy, for instance, buried people in his crawl space, but that was to keep them close, not to keep them hidden. And you just don't often see a random person kill someone and then decide to bury the body. And if you want to do sort of a morbid thought experiment, you guys out there, you're all true crime fans. I know all of you at some point, don't deny it, have thought about murdering somebody. <laughs> and you've thought about how you would get away with it if you did, and if you thought about killing somebody you knew, even if just sort of like as a thought experiment, one of the things you would have thought about is how you would get rid of the body. That is one of the main things you would think about, because that's what people do when they kill someone they know. They want to get rid of the body because they know they're going to be a suspect and it's important to hide the body. Maybe they'll just disappear. It's hard to prove a no body crime. Maybe they'll think they'll run away. There's all sorts of advantages to hiding the body, whereas random killers, random attackers tend to kill people and just leave them. They just go. And that's one of the things that our friends in the FBI and the behavioral analysis unit, they look at and sort of one of the, the markers when they are creating these, these profiles of a killer. That's one of the things they look at is, 
what was the disposal of the body like? So the fact that she's buried, I think, probably means it's not going to be somebody like Ronald Lee Moore. It's also probably not going to be somebody like a drug dealer. Now, some have speculated that Hay was actually buying drugs that day in between school and picking up her cousin, and then something went wrong. But, as we were just discussing, drug dealers don't normally take the time and great risk to bury a customer in the park. Dump them, maybe, but probably not even that. But the bigger problem is that he didn't use drugs. And I just think it's important to say this because I don't know how this rumor got out there. Well, I do know. But it's one of those rumors, like some of the ones we're going to talk about, that I think just needs to be squashed. And one of the more disingenuous uses of an August entry in Hayes' diary was an attempt to paint her as using drugs. And this was based on something that she'd written within it. But in reality, Hay was writing about a scene in Oz where people talk about drugs, and she compared drug addiction to how she felt about Adnan. And this was during the phase where she decided to break up with him because she was losing herself in the relationship. And in fact, if you read Hay's diary, you'll know that Hay at some point had actually made Adnan promise her that he would never get high. Obviously a promise he didn't keep. And she actually writes in her diary about he broke that promise towards the end of June. The chances that Hay went from feeling that way about him getting high to buying drugs from shady characters six months later are pretty slim, pretty slim. So I don't think it's going to be some random drug dealer. In fact, really the only evidence of a random attacker is foreign DNA on Hay's shoes that Alonzo Sellers found her body in what some people think are questionable circumstances and that Sellers would eventually fail a polygraph. We're going to talk about him in more depth here in a second. But let's talk about the DNA. It's laughable. Touch DNA on a pair of shoes found in the back of Hay's car that she may or may not have worn that day is the weakest possible DNA evidence imaginable. It might be that one day it is tied to someone connected to her. That would be somewhat stronger, though you know what that person would say. They would say, well, you know, I touched her shoes some other time and the DNA was on them. Random DNA that, as far as we know, isn't connected to anybody, including all the suspects we're going to talk, is basically the weakest possible evidence you could imagine. And if one day it turns out to be the killers, it would be one of those miracles of true crime that we'll talk about till the end of time. Yeah. And I mean, on your shoes, think about what your shoe touches. Everything, right? Your shoe touches everything and everything touches the floor. So the amount of touch DNA that can be on your shoes, it's actually just shocking that there's only a little bit of touch DNA that's unidentified on her shoes, because oftentimes you would find a lot of kind of foreign DNA on shoes, which are worn, like we said, all the time. Now, the seller's evidence is a little more compelling. The guy who finds the body is always a suspect. And his story is one that does raise eyebrows. But that is countered by another factor. Hay's body is buried. We are always wary of behavior analysis, maybe a little bit less so now that we have our good friend Julia Crowley, who's a former FBI profile, come put us in our place. But the general consensus is that random killers do not tend to hide their bodies because it's dangerous to do so. Even if Hay were murdered in Leakin Park after, say, a sexual assault, the killer would most likely just leave her body there. It's hard to overstate just how dangerous it was to take the time to bury Hay's body in a public place with a fairly high police presence given the reputation for violence and death Leakin Park had. And again, the placement of her burial was not that far from the road. If people like the FBI Behavioral Analysis Unit are to be believed, People tend to bury the victims they know and the ones that can more easily be tied back to them because they're paranoid. They think that they will be a suspect. They're going to leave some trace DNA on them, some hair that they did not mean to leave behind. And so if that body is found, the likelihood of some DNA that they could not keep from falling on that body would be traced back to them. And that's part of the psychology of why you tend to bury someone, a victim that you do know. It's worth the risk of sticking around with the body in the hopes that maybe no one will ever be able to prove they're even dead. So is a random killer possible? Yeah, but only in the barest sense of the word. Well, let's go back to Alonzo, because he is less of a random suspect than the sort of the general random person out in the world, the person we've never heard of. And look, 
a lot of times, maybe not a lot of times, but especially in these sort of serial killer cases, you know, you end up, think of the Long Island serial killer, think of the Golden State Killer. In both cases, it was somebody who was on nobody's radar. And all these people had spent all this time theorizing, putting all this evidence together, trying to prove it was this guy or that guy. And then it turns out somebody nobody's even noticed before. So random killings happen, particularly in those sort of serial killer situations. But the chances that in this case, this is a random killer, pretty slim. But Alonzo isn't all that random because he did find Hay's body. But there is something else about him that makes him less random than anyone else in the city of Baltimore and might have made him think, I need to do something with this body. It ties too closely to me. And that is where he lives and his route to work. So we're going to put this map up. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're probably looking at it right now. But Alonzo lives right next to the school. I mean, he is next door to the high school. When I first looked this up, I was shocked because I was trying to figure out where everybody lived. Like, where is everybody in relation to everybody else? Because in my mind, I was thinking Alonzo is going to live like in the middle of nowhere, Baltimore. The chances of him running into hay are basically zero. And then you pull up where he lives on the map, and boom, right there he is, and right there's the high school. So that is an interesting thing about him. Two of his routes to work take him through Leakin Park, one directly past where the body was found, which is why he found it. I mean, that part, not as surprising, right? Because that's the whole reason he ends up finding it in the first place is because he's driving back from his home to work when he finds the body. So, you know, it's not difficult to imagine at all that Alonzo runs into Hay somewhere near the high school. So this takes out sort of the problem of Hay going somewhere random. You know, this sort of like, where would she even run into her killer? Maybe she runs into him somewhere close to the high school. And things go wrong, and he ends up killing her. And because he's so close to the high school, because he's afraid somehow they could be put together, he decides to bury her in order to get rid of her. And he buries her in a place he's familiar with, a place that he drives through all the time, which is fairly common. You would think people, you know, they're going to bury somebody. They would not do it where they're a place they're familiar with, but people are so comfortable. They would rather do things where they're comfortable. And that ends up getting a lot of people in trouble. And of course, we know that Alonzo was arrested multiple times for streaking before the murders. It appears based on some later filings, that he was later arrested for a misdemeanor assault charge. And this charge has been described as him attacking a woman in a car that he didn't know. So similar, right? I mean, Alonzo, for whatever reason, at 2.45 in the afternoon, is streaking, runs into hay, somehow they get into an altercation, and he, he murders her, right? I mean, that's sort of how you have to imagine this going down. So that is pretty striking as you're trying to put together some sort of story of why Alonzo would be involved. There's at least a plausible story that you can tell that would put Alonzo and Hay in the same place at the same time in a situation where Alonzo would end up killing her. And one thing to know when we're looking at this map of where Alonzo lives and where he works, I found it really interesting that the distance, whichever path you take through Leakin Park, one of the two paths, it's only about a 13 or 14 minute drive from his home to work. Of course, in that time period, you could need to go to the bathroom so badly that you just can't hold it, you know, another five, six, seven minutes to make it to work in order to go to the restroom that you have to pull off on the side of the road. I have been in that situation, but it it is a short enough distance that it at least raises a little bit of eyebrows. Did you have to stop in Leakin Park to go to the bathroom when the drive isn't, say, something like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour? It was merely, you know, 14 minutes. And so looking at this map, I think kind of at least it was more compelling to me than hearing people just speculate because he could be a killer just because he found the body. But this whole path where he lived and also kind of the, the short length of his trip raise eyebrows to me and make this a stronger theory than I originally thought. One piece of evidence some people point to that isn't as significant are some marks on Hay's shoulder. The autopsy doesn't even bother to mention them, but in the years that followed, some have pointed to diamond-shaped marks that they believe are inflicted by the killer. Although it's easy to dismiss these out of hand as possibly being inflicted by any number of things during the moving of Hay's body or during the month that she's in the ground before she's found, 
Some believe they look like raised parts of a concrete tool. And here's where it's interesting. Sellers supposedly worked in concrete. And so some believe this is evidence that Sellers is the one who killed Hay. And then she lay in the back of his truck on some sort of concrete tool or in some sort of sadistic action that coincidentally does not appear to have involved rape or sexual assault. He used the tool on Hay. But there are two big problems here. First, as anyone in the innocence community knows, evidence that comes from markings on the body is extremely suspect. Everyone's skin acts differently to trauma, and most murderers aren't carefully inflicting that trauma on a non-moving person. That's one of the reasons that bite mark analysis has fallen so far out of favor in the forensic community. We don't know at what point the mark would have been made, how it could have been made. You know, was her blood still pumping at that point, or was it post-mortem? Was it while she was moving, in which case it wouldn't be kind of a clear diamond mark as we are kind of seeing on her shoulder. I do think it's particularly striking that it wasn't so pronounced that it would be mentioned in her autopsy. That is something that's been picked up on, you know, many years later when we don't have the advantage of looking at, you know, a report at the time that her body is being examined. And that's a huge problem with a lot of the stuff in this case. We talked about this with lividity. You got people who are looking at photographs 15 years later, not even great photographs, and a not great autopsy. And trying to draw some huge conclusion from that. And that's what you've got here. And and this is one of those things that I like. I think people should always think to themselves, and we've mentioned this in earlier episodes. Let's say you think Adnan Syed is absolutely innocent. And we were like, but there's some marks on her shoulder and they sort of match some shoes he had. Would you say, well, shoot, I guess he did it. Or would you say... Well, everybody knows that you can't trust those that kind of stuff. Forensics is basically rejected. Marks on human skin. That's ridiculous. I can't believe they're relying on that. If that's what you would say, if we were putting it forward as evidence against Adnan Syed, then you really shouldn't be grabbing onto it as the most important thing that makes you think Alonzo Sellers did this. And that's really not even the end of this. It's probably not surprising that even people who support Adnan fight over what these marks are. Given that we don't even know what to make of of this kind of stuff. You have some people who think they are from a tool, as Alice mentioned. But then you have others who think they're actually a result of some sort of pressure after Hay was buried. And this really goes into the lividity stuff. This is lividity stuff, not stuff that has to do with Alonzo Sellers. And this, they contend, actually bolsters the argument that she must have been kept somewhere else for some period of time before she was buried which would invalidate the state's timeline and make it much more likely that Adnan Sayed is not involved. But once again, the only support for this is that there's nothing at the burial site that could make the marks. But this is a huge assumption. No one was looking for anything like this. And the autopsy, as Alice said, doesn't even note it as significant. The notion that there was some sort of exhaustive search for what might have made these faint markings on Hayes' shoulder is silly. Maybe the marks were from the struggle. Maybe they were from the result of the way her body was twisted when she was buried. Maybe it's her bra strap or something left behind in the grave. Maybe it was from the the little cross or filled hockey stick that was in the trunk of her car. What almost certainly was not was a concrete grinding tool applied oh so gently to Hay's arm in the process of murdering her or one that she laid on the back of in Seller's truck while he, what, clocked out at Coppin State College and then drove around with her in the back of his truck for 12 hours before burying her. And if she was in the truck, what did he do with her car while he's driving her around in the truck? And how exactly did he pull all of this off without any help. Which leaves us with Seller's questionable past and the fact that he found hay. It's a good place to start in any investigation, but that's about it. First, although Serial made it sound like a miracle that Sellers found hay, the photos of the scene show that anyone paying any attention at all would know something was amiss. The ground was disturbed. Hay's hair and white jacket would have been visible, and she was barely buried at all, with parts of her body actually sticking out of the ground. Is it a coincidence he picked this spot to urinate? Sure, but it must have been an obvious place to stop as whoever buried Hay also picked this spot. We also know Sellers has an alibi. He didn't clock out of work until four that day after Hay would have been murdered. 
Now, that's not ironclad. Sellers basically worked alone and would leave work at times. In fact, that's what he was doing the day he found Hay's body. Still, you'd have to think that Sellers somehow ran into Hay sometime after 2.30, and it would probably be some sort of random chance meeting rather than a planned meeting because we have no indication that Hay communicated with Sellers or that she made a plan to see anybody. He would have had to kill her, stash her body, and have done all this in time to go back to work and clock out at four o'clock. It's not impossible, but given there's no evidence it happened and no reason to think Hay would have run into sellers that day, it's really nothing more than speculation on a very, very tight timeline. With no motive, not really much opportunity, an apparent alibi, and evidence pointing elsewhere, it's not surprising the police eliminated Sellers as a suspect. We'll keep him in our back pocket for now, but probably not for long. So let's talk about Don. So Don, as you know, is Hay's boyfriend at the time, Don Kleindienst. And they had been dating for a couple of weeks when she disappeared. In fact, they had started dating on January 1st, 1999, after Adnan and Hay broke up. So they worked together at Lens Crafters. Adnan had come to the store sometime after he and Hay broke up, and Don described him as polite and cordial. Don told police that he was at work until about 6 o'clock on the day Hay disappeared. He arrived home around 7. His father told him to call Owings Mill's store, and it was then that he learned Hay had never come to work and presumably was missing. At the time, Don did not seem overly concerned about Hay's disappearance, thinking like most people that she may have gone to California. And police noted his lack of concern, potentially hitting at an early thought that he may have had some involvement. And in fact, we know the police were searching around where Don lived for Hay's car. Obviously, if you find Hay's car down from where Don lives, that's going to be pretty significant. They also noted that he did not appear as enthused about their relationship as Hay was. You may recall, Hay basically had just fallen head over heels for Don. She's seven days into the relationship, and she's like updating her instant messenger profile, talking about hanging out with Don is her main thing. Her diary is replete with talk about his baby blue eyes and how wonderful he is and amazing he is and writing his name over and over and over again. I mean, all that stuff. Her last diary entry is about how much she loves him. Don, I think, was like, yeah, this is a girl I've been dating for a couple of weeks. <laughs> right? So, you know, you can imagine there's a little bit of a disconnect there between Don and Hay. Now, on February 1st, police spoke to Kathy Mitchell or Michael not really sure how to pronounce her name. Michelle, that's possible as well. She was a manager at Lens Crafters, and she stated that Don arrived for work around 9 or 2 a.m. and worked till 6 p.m. with a lunch break from 1.10 p.m. to 1.42 p.m. It's pretty clear she was looking at his time card when she said this, and his time card, for what it's worth, and we'll talk about that in a second, confirms this. Now, this is, this is going to become an issue. People are going to talk a lot about this time card and whether or not it is accurate. Now, the proponents of this theory that Don did it is that Kathy is somehow covering for Don with the timesheet. And why would Kathy do this? Well, the proponents of this theory say that it's because Kathy is Don's mother. But Kathy is not Don's mother, as some have claimed. She's actually his mother's partner. His mother managed a different store that Don would occasionally work at, so it's not as if Don and Kathy weren't close. She was effectively his stepmother, but just for the record, she is not his mother. On the day of the murder, Don was filling in at his mother's store. This led to some initial confusion when the police requested Don's time cards from the Owings Mill store that he normally worked at and received none. When they realized he'd actually been working that day at the Hunt Valley store, they pulled that time card, which then does confirm Don's alibi. Some conspiracy theorists have suggested that Don's mother or stepmother faked the time cards to give Don an alibi. First, there's no evidence of this. Some have pointed to the fact that Don has a different employee number on this card, 97, than he would have had at his other store, 162. There are several explanations for this. Don had a different employee number at a different franchise. Don was filling in for an employee at the other store, and his employee number was used for record-keeping purposes. Some other quirk of timekeeping we don't really understand. There could be many reasons for this. What's not clear is why this would matter if Don was faking his time card. Don's name is on the time card. 
Why use a different number? After all, it's undisputed that Don did work on occasion at the Second Lens Crafters franchise. Was this just a mistake? An oversight? Did Don's mother not know how to properly put in his number when she rearranged the coding? Was there some reason not to call him and get it while covering up for Don's murder? Because if you're going to go through the process of fibbing on a time card, might as well get it right. Make sure the numbers match. That's pretty easy. And it would have been just that, covering up for a murder. The truth is that Landscrafters had one of the earliest computerized payroll systems. Employees clocked in and out by computer. And any corrections or additions of time would have needed to occur before the company closed the payroll for that period, early in the following week. This payroll period closed on January 16th, 1999, meaning any adjustments would have had to have been made on the Monday after, or by the Monday after the murder. It would have been impossible to falsify Don's time for January 13th, weeks later. Which means you'd have to believe that Don decided to kill Hay that day, someone knew about it and helped him. They didn't cover it up later when Hay's body was found. But you'd also have to believe that while doing so, they shrugged their shoulders and said, eh, any employee number will do. The truth is, the Don theory has been thoroughly debunked. As the investigators hired by the pro-Adnan documentary, The Case Against Adnan Syed, put it, after interviewing more than 15 current and former employees of LensCrafters, employees of Luxottica Group, LensCrafters' parent, and even the developer who built the timekeeping software, we debunked the time card theory. It was, we concluded, impossible to adjust the computerized time card retroactively without leaving a trace. Now, these investigators, certainly no friends of the prosecution, are right. Given that Hay was almost certainly at least abducted before she was due to pick up her cousin, Don was in no position to kill her. It's impossible, and it doesn't make sense either. Don and Hay had been dating less than two weeks when she was killed, and by all accounts, they were still very much in their honeymoon phase. If they had any problems, Hay certainly didn't mention it. And if they did have problems, there was no reason for Don to not just break up with her. So no motive... No opportunity either. It's for some sort of rage-filled attack, that would require Don to have met with Hay, got in a huge fight, murdered her, hid the body, gotten back to work, avoided anyone noticing his absence, somehow getting away to bury Hay's body, and getting home an hour away at precisely the time you might expect, while, by the way, having someone fake his time card for him. And now, all these years later, Lens Crafters employees are still covering up for Don, the murderer. Even if you proved the time card was adjusted, even that would only give Don the barest opportunity to kill Hay. It doesn't mean he actually did. It is the bare minimum. You need to continue investigating Don and nothing more. If you can convince yourself that Adnan asking Hay for a ride the day she just so happened to get murdered and he just so happened to loan his car to Jay is a total coincidence, if you can convince yourself of that, making the leap to Don just so happening to ask his mom to cover for him so he could go play video games at the mall arcade that day shouldn't be too hard. We shouldn't mince words here. The Don theory is absurd, and it's made even worse by the fact it is directed at a completely innocent person, one who no serious investigator, not for the police, not for the prosecution, and not even for the defense, is considered a viable suspect. The stigma, the harassment... The pure slander Don has endured is an example of the very worst of true crime. There are a few things that we can say for certain in this case, but one of them is this. Don didn't kill Heyman Lee. But because I'm obsessive, <laughs> I ended up spending a lot of time trying to figure out the employee number thing that people talk about. It's basically the last bare straw that people who want to blame Don have to hang on to. And so after digging through like a lot of company filings, reading some cases where Lens Crafters was sued, calling people, <laughs> including including the Thompson company who handles Luxottica's employee records. This is sort of what I've come to believe. This is in part speculation on my part. But if you're really interested in this, you you want to figure this sort of employee number thing out. This is what I think happened. So in 2005, the Luxottica Board of Directors implemented what it called the Organization Management and Control System, which was meant to centralize and modernize control over the organization. And there were several pieces of legislation that coincided with this, but Luxottica, they implemented the Talent Luxottica platform, which assigns a six-digit number 
to an employee. Now, this is speculation here, but this coincides with California's decision in 2004 to change its labor laws to only allow employers to use the last four digits of an employee's social security number, rather the entire thing, for identification purposes. And this is one of those things we forget. Those of you who were around in the 90s may remember this, but like, Back in the day, you used your social security number for everything. My driver's license, when I first got a driver's license, had my social security number on it, which is just absurd. I can't even believe they did that. And you would use your social security number for identification. Then as the internet comes along and people start, you know, stealing people's identity in a much greater number, we started passing laws to protect that and to prevent people from using that, the entire number in particular, as an identification number. And California did this. At the same time, you have the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, which they mentioned in some of their filings is another reason they really need to figure out and have all this information centralized because you need to make sure all your filings are correct. And so if your employees are stealing a bunch of money from you because you don't have very good control over when they work and when they don't, that can be a problem. So the question many have asked is whether Don could have had a number for each franchise he worked at. And some have said no, and they've said that current employees of LensCrafters have confirmed this. The problem is, the organizational structure of the company has obviously changed significantly in the last 24 years, to include the number of digits in the employee number. The employee number displayed on Don's time card is four digits long, not six. And given that in 1999, LensCrafters had more than 30,000 employees, it doesn't make sense that the employee numbers would carry over to different stores nor does it make sense that don would have been employee number 162 which you'd have to believe if you think don has been assigned a single id number he will carry with him forever and always to include if he was ever rehired to the company much more likely is each franchise has a number and each employee who works at the franchise has a number and they're using that number sort of loosely to categorize their employees but probably what they're actually using for identification purposes is their social security number and i will say i was a little disappointed in Luxottica because i emailed basically everybody in the company i called them i left messages nobody would call me back the only person <laughs> And I'm going to give them a shout out. The only person who talked to me was the Thomas and Company, like, accountant lady. And so she walked this through for me to help me understand this. They only had records going back to 2016. But basically, she said that if you wanted records for an employee that was that old, you would need their social security number. That's how you would get it. The employee number wouldn't help. The Lux ID, which is what they call the six-digit number, used on everything. If you, if you dig into Luxottica stuff, if you read the employee handbook, which I ended up doing, they sign it with their Lux ID number. You log into all your stuff with your Lux ID number. It's pretty clear that now the Lux ID number is, it is attached to you and you would use it. And I think that's why sometimes you'll see people who will say, well, I talked to somebody and they've been there for forever and they've always had the same ID. Well, that's probably true. If you've been working at LensCrafters for less than 20 years, you probably have always had the same number that you've used for everything. But in 1999, I don't think that was true. So this is, we've avoided rabbit holes this entire time, but I decided to go down the rabbit hole on this and I am fairly convinced that that is what happened as far as the employee number goes. If that's something that's important to you, though, as Alice said, it doesn't even matter because it doesn't actually show anything, even if you used a different employee number at a different store. So. I think it's. I think it says something that the only rabbit hole we've really let ourselves go down is one to essentially show how ridiculous the Don theory is. Let that carry weight with you, <laughs> how you exactly. shouldn't go down this rabbit hole. It's so utterly ridiculous that you could hang all of this Don theory when nothing points to him on this time card number. And from 24 years ago, at a time when I remember writing my social security number at the top of every standardized test I took, right? I mean, you literally hand those to like a stranger and it's like in all, you know, in large numbers, my entire social security number. You used it for everything because identity theft was not as prevalent as it was and certainly not by like international, you know, ID ID thievers like we have today. And so that's why back then you really did use your entire social security number for everything and each franchise 
would basically just track their employees as needed, but they didn't really need that tracking number because they had their social security number. Exactly. So I think this is the last thing we should say about Don. I think people should leave Don alone. Let the man move on with his life. He knew Hay for a month. He dated her for two weeks. And in the words of my daughter's favorite movie, it is time to let it go. Cute to ads. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do where it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving, installations, or cleaning, Angie is there for you and they're there for you with confidence. So... Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly, which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I.com. Check them out today. Angie.com. A-N-G-I.com. Brett, before we move on, I have to share something with you because here is your free beauty and lifestyle hack for this episode. Fab Fit Fun is the best way to save money on beauty and lifestyle products from the brands you love. Discover new brands and treat yourself to something nice without overpaying. I am just busy in this stage of life. I don't have a lot of time to go find the newest and coolest things that'll make my life easier, but FabFitFun curates these awesome boxes for me, and they happen to just know exactly what I want, whether it's this new overnight duffel bag or the exact waist pack that I've been looking for to make running after my kids more easy, or these amazing earrings that I'm wearing right now. They seem to know exactly what I am looking for without me even knowing it, and really, it's a secret that you need to know about because FabFitFun was voted the best membership by Glamour Magazine. They offer a curated assortment of full-size products across beauty, fashion, and lifestyle categories at discounted prices you won't find anywhere else. And I just have to back up Alice on this. My wife has the earrings as well that came in the latest box, and she loves them. You're going to love them too, but you got to sign up at FabFitFun.com slash prosecute. Customize your box and get access to discounts up to 70% off on brands like Fenty, Free People, and Our Place, to name a few. Not in love with this season's options? Take the credit to shop their exclusive flash sales of up to 70% and save on the biggest name brands out there. If you join FabFitFun as a new seasonal member right now, you'll get 20% off your membership. So your first box is only $47.99 for up to a $300 value each season but only while supplies last fab fit fun boxes sell out join fab fit fun today and save at fabfitfun.com slash prosecute that's fabfitfun.com slash prosecute alice my wife was doing laundry today and she told me we need to get more earth breeze and she was a hundred percent Right. We're so proud to have Earth Breeze as a sponsor, and we know you will love their product. If you've ever wondered why laundry detergent comes in these massive plastic jugs, they're heavy. You have to lug them around. You have to find somewhere to put them. They're inconvenient, and they end up in landfills. Well, the solution is Earth Breeze. Imagine for a moment something that looks like a dryer sheet, but it's not. It is a liquidless laundry detergent sheet that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. No measuring, no mess, and no heavy lifting. That's right, no plastic jugs, and it gets the job done. You will still get a powerful clean. Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and our clothes come out clean every time. 
Right. It's really true. You know, I do so much laundry these days and Earth Breeze is my new favorite detergent. And I love that it's better for the planet and just so much easier to use. The packaging is lightweight and biodegradable. And I can fit 720 loads of sheets where I used to fit just one 60 load detergent jug. I didn't realize how itchy old fashioned detergent made me, but Earth Breeze is dermatologist tested and I truly feel the difference. Trust me, there's no reason not to switch. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors for 40% off earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors. So now that we've put to bed the Don theory, let's move on to another very interesting character in this entire Adnan saga, and that is Bilal. Maybe Bilal did it. He's a criminal and a sexual predator, albeit of young men. But Bilal was close to Adnan. One popular and to this point wholly unsubstantiated theory is that Bilal had abused Adnan and Adnan had shared his secret with Hay. At some point, Hay threatens to out Bilal and Bilal kills Hay as a result. It makes for an excellent screenplay for a forgettable episode of Criminal Minds or CSI, but there's no reason to think it happened here. Once again, we are confronted with an absolute lack of evidence. The Bilal theory got a bit of a shot in the arm when Adnan's conviction was vacated as one of the pieces of evidence presented was a note supposedly written by Bilal threatening to kill Hay. But after the vacation of the conviction, this note has become controversial, with the former prosecutor in the case releasing the note. As we discussed in an earlier episode, when viewed in context, it's patently obvious it's not about Bilal killing Hay. Now, Bilal is shady enough that if you turned out to be Hay's killer, no one would be surprised. But as for evidence of it, other than good-sounding conjecture... There really isn't anything here. And if we're going to look at kind of criminal history to point to potential guilt, Bilal's criminal history of, you know, being a sexual predator is certainly much closer to something that could translate to potentially murdering uh, a young woman. Although, honestly, when we see sexual predators, they typically stay in their lane. So if he is a sexual predator of young men, Typically, we see that the victims are all young men. And she, of course, is a young woman. And I, I note this because people have, you know, really harped on Alonzo, who we've already left behind, but Alonzo's criminal history of streaking. I think it's a much larger jump to go from streaking to murdering Hay than it is to go from sexual predator to potentially some sort of sexual predation gone wrong into a murder. But still, all of this is conjecture. There is nothing to support that Bilal had to do with it, except his name does come up over and over, and he is the one who gets Adnan his phone under his own name and his account just the day before Hay goes missing. And I'll just say this about Bilal. Bilal, is, he's obviously a scumbag, and when someone dies and there's a scumbag in, in the vicinity, it's always tempting to say it's them, but... One thing Alice pointed out, his victims are young men. And the other thing is Bilal, you know, he's, the way he committed his crimes, Bilal would essentially knock these kids out. He'd give them nitrous oxide, knock them out, and then abuse them. You know, he's a coward at the end of the day. And it's hard to imagine him looking Hay in the eyes and murdering her. He just doesn't seem like he's got that in him. And this, this murder was a strangulation murder. It was a very personal murder. And I don't know, you know, I guess if your theory is that someone walked up behind Hay and hit her in the back of the head, knocked her out and then strangled her, that would be a little bit more consistent with Bilal. There was some trauma to Hay's head, though I don't think based on the autopsy and granted, once again, autopsy is, is very cursory. I don't think it was that enough kind of trauma to knock her out like that. I think it probably more likely happened during the murder itself. So... I get that Bilal is a popular alternative theory. If it was Bilal's DNA on her shoes, that would be that would be pretty significant. But it's been almost a year since Adnan's conviction was vacated. Obviously, it's been reinstated by the appeals court. It's now gone up to the Supreme Court. I would think that if the city of Baltimore had 
connected his DNA to the shoes, and they would have his DNA because he's he's a convicted felon. They'd have Alonzo Sellers too. I mean, both of them, they should have their DNA based on DNA collection for criminal activity. They should have both of their DNA. So I would imagine they have compared that DNA to the touch DNA on her shoes and it didn't match. If it did match, whole new ball game. You know, we're talking about this story in a lot of different ways and that'll be a heck of a follow-up episode if that ever comes out. But right now... As much as I dislike Bilal, I don't think you're going to be able to pin this one on him. Okay, we are flying through. Look at us being concise, Brett. All you have to do is wear us out by going to the pool and not sleeping with our young children, and we just get things done because we are about to land on a theory that is probably one of the most talked about other than Adnan did it, and that's that Jay did it. Given the evidence, one of two things seems as though they have to be true. Either Jay killed Hay or Adnan did. Jay has most of the things Adnan had. He had means and he had opportunity, if no apparent motive. All the cell phone pings that hurt Adnan hurt Jay too. And if Jay killed Hay and lied about it, there's not much about the day that doesn't work out. Maybe Adnan really did let him borrow his car and cell phone, and Jay seized upon that opportunity for reasons we don't really understand. It's an awfully convenient coincidence for Adnan, but coincidences do happen. Maybe that was even the point. Jay always intended to kill Hay and blame Adnan, and when this opportunity arose, he seized it. There are a couple problems, though. One is motive. What is it? Adnan said there were times that Hay was upset with Jay because he was cheating on Stephanie. Could that be a motive? Maybe, but it's a really weak one. And why did he hate Adnan enough to frame him for murder? Was that just convenient? But if it was, his hatred for Hay must have been significant if he was willing to kill one person and frame another and ruin that person's life forever. Maybe it wasn't planned. Maybe Jay just ran into Hay but where? And when? And this all just happened to happen on the day Adnan had asked Hay for a ride. But there's a bigger problem, one that has led Adnan supporters to largely abandon Jay in favor of other suspects. Jay and Adnan were, by Adnan's own admission, together most of that day. And the calls made on Adnan's phone at seemingly critical times were made to different people that only one of them knew. Take the Yashir call, for instance. The Yashir call is definitely Adnan. But then there are the calls to Patrick and to Jen Pusateri, which are almost certainly Jay. So if Jay did it, it's hard to know how he did it in a way that does not involve Adnan. And because of how intricately tied they are that day, I think it's incredibly telling that Adnan supporters basically have to admit that Jay had nothing to do with it. Because if Jay had something to do with it, Adnan is right there next to him. There's just no way Jay would have had an opportunity to carry out this murder without Adnan knowing or being part. And there's an advantage to it being Jay because you lose a lot of the conspiratorial aspects of the case. We're going to talk a lot about the conspiracy aspects when we talk about Adnan. We haven't talked about those a lot with the other suspects, but they're there. In order for a random person to do this, for Bilal to have done it, for Alonzo Sellers to do it, you have to believe there was this conspiracy, a pretty big one in place to frame Adnan using Jay. If you think Don did it, you got to believe in two conspiracies. One, to cover up for Don, and in addition to that, the Jay conspiracy to frame Adnan. So Jay is a natural go-to. And I think a lot of people, when they look at the evidence, really do come into this camp where it has to be Jay or Adnan. I mean, I know that's where I sort of ended up. And we've talked about that throughout the show, how things happen that just, no matter how attractive you might think another suspect would be, the fact that they happen just make you feel like, man, this is, this just feels like this has to be Jay or Adnan. We talked about Jen Pusateri and how she knows so much. She knows that Hay was strangled when nobody else knew that. She knew all the details that Jay had told her. And then Jay obviously knows where Hay's car is. I mean, these are things that just make you feel like whatever happened, Jay is involved one way or the other. Maybe he's the murderer and he's framing Adnan, but it seems like he has to be involved. But can he be involved if Adnan's not? Now, we know that Hay disappeared sometime between 2.30 and 3.30. 
you know, 2.15's when school lets out. I think you can assume that for 15 minutes or so, I mean, she's not getting kidnapped directly from Woodlawn. So give it 2.30 to 3.30. At 2.36, the phone is south of Woodlawn near Jen's house. So at 2.36, the phone, which we know Jay has, is down at Jen's house. It's not up near Woodlawn. Not where it would need to be for him to be grabbing her at that time at 315 it's west of the high school heading towards best buy 321 it's in the same zone at no time during the critical period is it in the area of woodlawn that it would need to be for jay to grab hay unless she came to him for some unknown reason or he ran into her in one of those places but then jay essentially becomes the same as the random attacker if he killed hay where was she when he grabbed her, and how did he pull it off with no one noticing? You know, Jen Pusateri's house, which we mentioned, is sort of south of Woodlawn. J- or Hay is going to head north to get her sister. So why would she be going down there? There just doesn't seem to be any time when the cell phone, which we know is with Jay, lines up with Hay. And by the way, we know it's with Jay, not only because of the phone calls that are being made, because that's what Adnan told us. You know, this is another one of those circumstances where... Adnan has told us and has never disputed that during this period, Jay has his phone in his car. So if he's got the phone and these calls are being made and it's nowhere near where Hay is, when's he grabbing her? And what did he do with Adnan's car while he was disposing of Hay? Because Hay has her car. Her car obviously gets stashed somewhere. Hay gets buried. But there are two vehicles involved here. I mean, one of the things that is nice about Jay's story about Adnan is you got somebody to drive both cars. So at this point, you have to sort of bring maybe Jen into it. She has to be helping him out. She has to be driving one of the cars while he drives the other. Assume for a second that the cell phone records are all wrong. All the locations are wrong. We can't trust any of them. That still only leaves one time that Jay could have killed Hay and Adnan not been involved. Between 2.15 and 3.30. If Adnan is telling the truth about being at Woodlawn, waiting for track practice to start. So just imagine Adnan's hanging out at Woodlawn and Jay is going to strike at this point. This is the only time that Jay could have killed Hay, but this is when you have that Nisha call, and it becomes so important. Look, the Nisha call was not a butt dial. It wasn't. Nisha remembers it happening the day right after Adnan got his cell phone, and at the time the call was actually made. Nisha remembers Adnan putting Jay on the line, which is consistent with Jay's story. Jay mentioned it was some girl from Silver Springs, which is where Nisha is from. And by the time he talked to the defense team, Ali, Adnan's brother, he was apparently not named Ali, but is called that in the defense file, so that's what we're going with, was also aware of the call. Information that could only have come from either Nisha or Adnan, dispelling any notion that this is some sort of police plant. And if Adnan and Jay talked to Nisha, then Adnan was with Jay at precisely the time the murders had to have happened. If Jay killed Hay, Adnan was with him while he did it. It is almost impossible to craft a scenario where Jay is killing Hay and Adnan is not involved. There you have it. <laughs> Should we take a break so that people can scream with their hair on fire for a while before <laughs> we move on to even more things that can make people scream with their hair on fire? Sure. That's I think that's exactly what we should do. We've you know, at this point we've been talking for about an hour and we have a long way to go. And we have come to really the only theory that's left, and that's the theory that Adnan Syed was somehow involved in this case. So tomorrow we are going to dive into that. We're gonna talk about the evidence for Adnan's innocence. We're gonna talk about the evidence for Adnan's guilt. And then when we finish with that, we're going to give you our theories of what happened and how it happened. And then we're going to talk about a whole lot of other stuff too about this case. I have a feeling that tomorrow's episode might be a long one. We've been talking about this case now for many, many weeks and many, many episodes. And there's just so much that we still have to say, despite all the hours we have spent on this. So... 
that's that. Alice, do you have anything you want to add to this <laughs> to this round of theories? I can I can just imagine like the interwebs, just like a massive bonfire that's reaching the heavens. And you're asking me if I want to add a little more kindling to it. No, not yet. Not till tomorrow. And look, I, I know people are going to have thoughts and they're going to have questions and they're going to have their own theories and they're going to have their own take on this. You know, I mean, and, and I totally get that. And we want to hear about it. We have heard we have heard you up to this point. You haven't been shy. Continue to send us emails, prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Tell us what we got wrong. Tell us why you think, no, it actually definitely was Alonzo Sellers who did it. You know, I, I will tell you this. I have no interest in hearing your Dawn rants. <laughs> I am done with Dawn. That is just, like I said, I can only handle one giant conspiracy in any case. If it takes two conspiracies for him to be guilty, then I don't really want to hear about it. So let's move on from that. And can we have a you new know. term, too? When you have a following a rabbit trail for a ridiculous theory, that, that was like a rage rabbit trail. Brett, I've never seen you so rageful <laughs> to go down that rabbit trail in a good way. <laughs> you were like, this is so utterly ridiculous that I'm going to go down this ridiculous trail. I'm going to find the Hansel and Gretel seeds everywhere and they will show you how ridiculous this is. <laughs> well, I just got so irritated with Exotica. I mean, they need to get some people to answer their phones. I don't know what they're doing up there in New York. The problem is they're a Milan based entity. I thought about calling Milan. I did not go that far. They have an American-based media relations team. But I guess, you know, podcaster who wants to talk about a 24-year-old murder is not at the top of their list. I was, probably was too honest because I would lead with that in my messages. I'd be like, hey, looking at this murder from 25 years ago. I have a question. And they're like, do not return that call. <laughs> <laughs> you should have been like, I want to buy some eyewear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Please call me go. back. I want to make a very large order of eyewear. But Thomas and Company. Shout out to them. They are very responsive. So those people deserve some praise. Okay, Alice, do you want to answer some questions? Absolutely. Okay, Alice. Okay, this person says, this is from Raquel, who says, I am in the process of applying to law school. Any advice on writing a personal statement? It's all about storytelling, right? Don't try to, this is the same advice for being an attorney. Don't be someone you're not. You can convey so much about who you are and really reach someone else with the most what you may think is a boring story. So something as simple as growing up on a farm, you know, maybe not everyone does that. But if it's if it's meaningful to you and you're able to convey that, that can really strike a chord with those who are reading your personal statement. You know, a lot of people think they have to write this like fantastic story of how they, you know, started a nonprofit and lived in, you know, a third world country and built latrines and taught children and whales sign language. <laughs> you know, something amazing like that. That has to be a personal statement. But some of the most impactful statements, I think, are very vulnerable and very honest and inward analytical of how something that may seem completely mundane is actually earth shattering. Right. That it's the juxtaposition of that writing, I think, can really grab someone's attention. Because remember, these admissions officers are reading tens of thousands, if not more, statements and for the most part, you might get a glance before they throw it to the next pile. So I would just say, write about something that truly is meaningful to you because that will jump off the page. But if you taught Wales sign language, definitely mention that because that for will sure. get you into any law school in America. Alice is right. Be yourself. You let them know. They, they see through, you know, BS. They'll see through the BS. So let them know who you are, you know. The hard thing about law school is you're up against so many people who have great grades and great LSAT scores and everything else. And you just, you have to, you have to, and it's, it's hard to do. You have to connect with somebody you're never going to see who's sitting in a room reading what you've written. So being authentic, I think is, is a way to do that, that a lot of people miss because if they pick it up and they read the first sentence and they think, eh. They're just going to put it down and go on. For example, I, I can't totally remember, but I think my personal statement, the entire scene took place while I sat on a public school bus as a six-year-old going to school for the first time when I didn't speak English. But like nothing happened, right? The, from the outside, it was super boring. The entire contents of the story was me sitting on a public school bus. But hey, it got me into law school. So there you go. 
You can steal it. Yeah, I mean, what law school wouldn't take Alice, right? I mean, good scratches. <laughs> All right. Liability, liability. Because <laughs> we're going to do Adnan. M bracket 517 says they just want a shout out. So shout out to M bracket 517. You're awesome. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. We have like a lot. We have a People, lot. Now. You guys are really responding to this. You know, it's our it's our shameless plug. I was just going to say, if you leave a five-star review on Apple and leave a question, we will answer your question for you. And thank you to the one-star person who said we were asking for five-star reviews. We absolutely were asking for five-star reviews. And yeah, if, there was was the ever, if there was ever any question as to whether we're asking for five-star reviews, let me put that to bed. I'm asking for five-star reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And if sorry. you leave a four-star review and a question, it won't get answered. So there you did go. <laughs> I, did I stutter? I'm so sorry. <laughs> so this is a good question, especially since we're doing this case. This is from Poppy CC. How do you check your biases? Like what concrete steps do you take when working in a case in life or for the podcast to ensure that you're arriving at a conclusion based on the evidence and not your preconceived ideas? seems like it would be very challenging and high stakes when people's lives are in your hand. So I'm curious how big a role this consideration takes in your preparation. And I'll go ahead and answer first. I think the most important thing, whatever you want to call it, preconceived notions, biases, whatever. I mean, the bias has sort of such a pejorative that I think a lot of people don't like to talk about it. But the most important thing is to recognize that you have a preconceived notion. <laughs> because I think too many people want to tell themselves that, oh no, you know, I'm I am completely unbiased. We've seen a lot of that on Twitter recently, as we've talked about Adnan, a lot of people who've been telling us that they were completely unbiased. And man, it is so obvious that Adnan say it is innocent and they are so upset with us <laughs> for taking this position. And I always want to be like are you sure you're unbiased? Because it seems like you're really passionate about this in a way that may transcend the evidence. So I think identifying what you think in the beginning is important. With the very first episode, we talked about how when I finished Serial, I thought, eh, he probably did it. And that's literally what I thought. Eh, he probably did it. Kind of moved on, right? So I knew going in that my preconceived notion is he probably did it. And for me, I then really like to try and prove myself wrong. I think that's a lot of fun. To try and prove yourself wrong. So I'm always looking for sort of thinking about like what are the things that are important to me? Why do I think that? What are the what are the bases for my belief? And then try and find things that contradict that. And I think if you can go in honestly about what you think, what your preconceived notions are, you're much more likely to be able to navigate those and not just arrive where you started. And even if you do arrive where you started, do so because you had good reasons to be there, not just, you know, you were going to get there because you were only going to look at the things that supported your position. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, lawyers are supposed to be like the most pessimistic people ever. I like to think of myself as an optimist, but when I step back, I know a trait that I have and most lawyers do have is that I always think I'm wrong. And so I do try to go see why I am wrong. And in doing so, you essentially whittle away at what are the possible theories, kind of like what we did in this episode, where ultimately a theory does begin to emerge that is the only one that I've been able to disprove. And I think going into it as trying to attack your own position is a way to understand why you hold the beliefs that you do. You know, is it because the evidence is just so strong or is it because you are, you know, you, you, you view this through a lens that maybe should be a little wider. The other thing I want to note is that prosecutors do not work on cases alone at all. We are not the fact finders, right? Our agents and law enforcement investigate the cases for us. And so you always have at least an investigator on the case who you typically have a relationship with. And at least for me, my favorite part of the job is having that back and forth with fellow prosecutors and certainly with my agents, where we are each trying to tear apart the case file. What's missing? What still needs to be done? What are the holes? What's the grand jury going to ask? What is that skeptic juror? Because all it takes is one to have a hung jury. What is that skeptic one juror going to ask? And we need to have an answer for it. And can we fill in those holes? And if we can't, why? 
And if we can't fill in those holes, do we have beyond a reasonable doubt here? And so it is an iterative process throughout the investigative phase. It's fascinating. It's like building a puzzle. And you are not the only one. I mean, I can't imagine my life being more different than most of the law enforcement officers I work with, right? They look different than me. They, a lot of them are like undercover on the streets. Like I can't be undercover for anything. Like everyone would see right through me. And they are able to interact with a lot more different populations than I ever do being a lawyer. And so they bring a phenomenal different perspective to me that is constantly pushing me and challenging me. And over the years, you see a lot. You see when you're proved wrong. You see when, you know, maybe assumptions you've held before are over and over again kind of have a different outcome. And that causes you to change your thinking, to have that experience, to know how to go about your investigation more fulsomely. Yeah. And I think it's so important for lawyers because, you know, you also want to win. Winning is something you want to do in the law. And we've talked about how it's not the most important thing, but it's, it is important. <laughs> and if you don't recognize sort of those preconceived notions, those biases, it will blind you to the weaknesses in your argument or your case. And I, I can't tell you the number of times that I'll have like an oral argument and I'm looking at the case and there's one sort of question that's nagging at the back of my mind. And I was like, ah, that's not important. And then I get up there in front of these three judges and one of them asked that question and it's like, dang it. I wish I had thought more about the answer to that question, but I didn't want to face it. You know, I didn't want to face that question because it actually was a weakness and I didn't want to see weakness. I wanted to believe my thing was so strong and just undefeatable. And so I didn't want to address that. I wanted to address the straw man parts. Right. And, and that's, that is a problem. And when we do these cases, I feel a great, I was nervous about doing this case. I know Alice was too, because I feel a great duty to you guys, to the victim, to Adnan, to everybody involved, to do as good a job as possible and to present this as, as straightforwardly as possible to try and reach some sort of truth. Because I just feel like that's what we owe you guys. And so for me, trying to put aside the sort of biases and address this in, a, in an honest, straightforward way was really important. Hopefully we've done that. I mean, I know one of the problems is people think you're biased if you disagree with them, right? Because disagreement these days just means, well, you must be biased because you disagree with me. And obviously that's usually not the case. My thing, one funny bias I have, which none of you will believe, but it's true, is I always want them to be innocent. <laughs> I always want them to be innocent. I have a, when I, like, when I watch documentaries, you know, the first few episodes always have me, you know, like Serial. Serial's a good example. As I said, it, by the end of Serial, my thought was Adnan probably did this. But in the beginning, I was all about it. I was like, he was at the library. He was there with Asia McClain. What are you talking about? You know, this poor guy. Listen to him. He sounds so innocent, right? I mean, that's that's what I was I thinking. I have watched documentaries with Brett, and that's exactly how he sounds. He goes to another register, and it's like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty great to watch him lose his mind about wanting to believe in the innocence. <laughs> And then I have to like, yeah, I have to like wind myself back up. Be like, hold on now. You know, I got to think about this. You know, we're already thinking about the cases we're going to do after this. And we're going to do, probably before the year is out, another innocence case. And, and I just got to tell you, when I got done with the podcast, I was like, that guy is innocent. And I haven't decided whether he actually is or not. <laughs> so, so we're still researching it. But that is always how I feel. Like, so any of y'all who feel bad about getting sucked in by these podcasts, I always get sucked in. And I have to take a step back and be like, wait a second. Let's actually oh. look at this, put the emotion aside. I love to be entertained. Like, if you want to give me a good documentary where you want me to believe something, I am like full board on until I have to actually step back and do research for the podcast. Yeah. The only, I tell you what, there's only one case. There is one documentary where I got to the end of it and I was like, that guy is guilty. And I have totally reconsidered this in the years that come. And I'll go ahead and tell you all this, even though this is going to be a little bit of a spoiler. Though I will say I'm still open and if we ever do this case, we are going to do it. Unlike everybody who's ever done this case, if we ever do it, we are going to start from a position of not assuming that the West Memphis Three are innocent. We are not going to start from the position <laughs> that they're innocent. Because everybody who does it, it's like, and now let's do a podcast on how these people are obviously innocent, but we're going to, you know, we're going to do it straightforward. We're not going to do that. But I'll tell you, when I finished Paradise Lost, I was like, Damien Nichols, he is guilty. I don't know about those other guys, <laughs> but that guy 
is guilty. And I was so surprised that so many people watched it and thought he wasn't guilty. And and now I just realized like that documentary was so, I mean, it's a great documentary. It's a great thing to watch, but don't know that it really presented it in an unbiased way. So one day we're going to do that case and we're going to, we're going to start from a, <laughs> like I said, we're not going to start from the position that they're guilty or they're innocent. We're actually going to look at the case and it'll probably take another 15 episodes to do it. I was going to say, you know, people are now losing their minds because they think you're doing a Taylor Swift thing where you're dropping an Easter egg that our next like series is going to be it's West not. Memphis. Three. Let's just make it clear. <laughs> we have not had time. Yeah. <laughs> We've been... got to have another baby before we can I... do West Memphis. Three. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. So <laughs> it's going to be a real sacrifice there. So just just know that we've been knee deep, eyeball deep in Adnan and it's all consuming if you can't tell. Yeah. Well, look, this has been a lot of fun. We've spent another 20 minutes talking about things other than the case. <laughs> but like I said, we will be back tomorrow. And tomorrow it's going to be all Adnan. We're going to talk about Adnan. We're going to talk about the evidence for him, the evidence against him. We're going to reach some conclusions. We're going to give our own theories. And just talk about sort of things in general about this case, where it goes next, what we think about that, you know, our general thoughts. So hopefully it'll be something you guys enjoy. And it'll be sad because that will be the last time until the – Maryland Supreme Court rules, and we do another legal briefs on it. That'll be the last time we talk about Adnan. And it is kind of sad because you do you start with a podcast, and it's all fresh and new, and you got your long list of cases you're going to do. And then every time you do one, it's like, well, we did it. We're never going to do that case again. It's kind of sad. I think it's kind of sad. Maybe nobody else does. Everybody else is sick of, sick of Adnan, I'm sure. No, that's how I feel about each of our kind of big series kind of like my baby and then i have to like let it go out into the world and you know. you know just like with your children you're like well i've done all i can and i can't hold you forever now i need to release you to the world and come what may <laughs> yeah exactly it's 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 a lot of pressure man it's a lot of pressure yeah. okay well we've talked enough we will be back tomorrow to finish up this case but until then i'm brett and i'm alice and we are the prosecutors So after all these years, after all these years, you know, we've been friends for a really long time. And Brett went and got me lunch one day, which was really nice because I was like working, like, you <laughs> know, you, like I, I working through it. And uh-huh. I was like working through work and I was like, he's like, I'll get you lunch. I was like, oh, that's so nice of you. Okay, I'm going to keep working. And he comes back with my order, which is very nice. And then like a big gulp Coke. And like, if you even know, do you even know me? I you drink know, water I- and that's it maybe sparkling water and and you're like do you not drink coke and i was like did you just do this so you could have two big gulps <laughs> i mean Well, I mean, this is a big episode, Alice. You gotta, you gotta. You know, Look, you gotta... if I get hangry halfway through, we'll pause it. But I don't know if I'm hangry. I might rant a lot, so it might be good. There you go. Okay, I'm ready to end it on. You have a good. Let's agi- do it. I was about to say a good agitator for me. <laughs> I do have one for you. Adjective.